Welcome to MMI's Minnesota Clarinetists, a virtual series where we feature Minnesota's own performers and teachers. Today, we are so excited to have Pat O'Keefe, who is the instructor of clarinet at University of Wisconsin in River Falls, and he is a woodwind player of the Zeitgeist Ensemble here in Minneapolis, St. Paul. Welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah, thank you so much for um, being here with our virtual series. Um, so tell us kind of how, how did you get started? How did you decide to study music and clarinet so closely? Well, um, it's kind of a, a long story. I, uh, I didn't start on the clarinet. I actually, my first instruments that I studied was the violin. Um, and I was terrible at it. I was just really, I had no feel for it. I was interested in it for about a week, but you know, I just, it wasn't a thing, but I, I learned to read music for that. I was, uh, my, I was, when I grew up, I was born in Superior, Wisconsin. And so I lived in Superior and in Duluth and in Virginia up on the Iron Range. That's where I played violin was up in Virginia. Um, the first ever instrument I wanted to play was drums, like most young boys. I remember going, when I lived in Duluth, it's like a real little kid. Uh, the Duluth Symphony had these orchestra concerts called lollipop concerts for kids, you know, and I would, my parents would take me to those and I could do, you could go, I always go up on stage and see the instruments and I would just go straight to the timpani. I just wanted to see drums, you know, like I just really dug that. And I remember getting some little like toy drum sets when I was a kid that I broke within like a day because they're like plastic, you know, paper heads. Anyway, so I started on the violin and that was just a, a, a I, I was not good at that at all. <laughs> Um, but then the, my family relocated to Omaha, Nebraska when I was 11, which is really kind of where my family's kind of been, where I go home at holidays, you go home. So um, when I was just before seventh grade, um, my mom had uh, heard from some neighborhood friends that there was a really good woodwind teacher at this local music store called the Parker School of Music. Um, it was in uh, Rockbrook Village, a little shopping center close to our house. And uh, they had a good woodwind teacher and their kids were studying there. And my older sister had played the clarinet uh, first before she went on to oboe and English horn. And so um, the, my mom said, well, hey, do you, uh, we have her old clarinet. Do you want to take some lessons? And so I said, okay. I mean, it wasn't the last thing I was looking for. It was, they, it was my mom's idea. It was not my idea. And uh, so, I, you know, when I said, sure, I can, you know, I'll try it out. So that's how I started. It was right before seventh grade. And then, you know, I went into seventh grade and, you know, I think for a lot of kids, you know, you're maybe looking for something that makes you different or special. And I had tried some other things that did not make me special. I was not the great athlete I wanted to be, uh, <laughs> like a lot of young boys, or I was not the super smart physics and math whiz I thought I might be. That was, no. <laughs> it turns out I could, I could sort of play the clarinet. So, that, okay, that's my thing. So, but then I, once I got into that, I started to really get serious about it. I, uh, and I started to listen more to music a lot. And, uh, and then I picked up some other instruments. I am, um, uh, you know, I started clarinet right before seventh grade. And I, I saw, hey, our junior high had a jazz band, but you had to play sax to play in the jazz. And so I picked up saxophone in eighth grade. And then in ninth grade, I picked up bassoon because, oh, there's this funky thing called the bassoon and the orchestra. And sometimes they don't have as many bassoon players. I'll try that out and picked up some flute. So I did, I did that, I actually did a lot of doubling when I was in high school. And my first professional work actually was when I was 15 years old, I got hired to play uh, this theater in Omaha to play a show to double on single and double reads. And I thought, oh, this is awesome. And, and I ended up playing a bunch of shows throughout high school with this, with this theater. I, I remember I made, it was like a, one of these, I, the show ran for like a month and I made $150. <laughs> I was like, I worked it out, it was like, I think it was less than $5 a night. What did I know? I was 15 and I was getting paid to play music. So that was, I loved it. Wow, so what I thought, yeah, this is that. what I want to do. <laughs> I want to play in shows and double. But anyway, as I, as I went through, uh, as I went through high school and was looking into college, uh, I, I realized that I was most, most interested in the clarinet. And that's the instrument that I wanted to focus on. And, you know, like a lot of, probably like most, uh, younger players. I just wanted to be my teacher. I had so many great teachers, great band directors in junior high and high school and great private teachers. And in high school, one of my private teachers, John Ziegler, was the principal clarinetist in Omaha Symphony. And he also um, taught at the u local university, uh, University of Nebraska at Omaha. So I like, well, that's what I want to do. I want to, you know, I'm playing an orchestra and teach at the local college. So I just, you know, it's, 
that. So that was what I thought, okay, this is going to be my path. So when you, I went off to um, college. Were you playing bass clarinet as well, kind of during that time or? No, no that didn't come. That, I mean, I played it a little bit, but that came much, much later in my life. Gotcha. Yeah. When I, when I kind of started to do a lot of new music, because bass clarinet is like the standard double in new music. So you got to be able to be proficient on that. And I, had, I did a lot of new music when I was at Indiana and at New England Conservatory. I did a lot of that stuff. Um, and also was, uh, I got into, was interested in world music. I was interested in music of other cultures, uh, partly because my, um, my, you know, there was always music around in my family. Um, uh, my, you know, my parents, you know, my parents were professionals. My father was a banker, but he played the baritone ukulele was his thing. He was like, you know, let's pull out, let's have some songs and have my dad and Sam, Sam, get out the uke. And, uh, and, uh, and, you know, my mom sang in church choir and they were really supportive of like, uh, of like the symphony. They were always going to the symphony and Omaha symphony and opera. So they'd take me when I was young and showed an interest. But my brother was also, who's older, he's a, a professional musician has been here in the Twin Cities for many decades. And when he started to get in, he started to, he started on harmonica and then mandolin and other strings, and he got heavily into percussion, world percussion. And he and I like uh, both kind of went divergent paths. He, he was, is entirely self-taught for the most part. I mean, he, he didn't go to college for music. He just did it. He was working as a musician, even in his teen years, and, uh, and just learning that way and then grabbing teachers when he could, private teachers. And so when I started to show an interest in music, he was always like, I would always get records Christmas and birthday. And then when I showed an interest in world music, it's like, okay, here's, he's just always feeding me stuff. So those interests were always there. I grabbed like every world music class I could do, you know, in, in undergrad and grad school. So when I was in Augusta, playing the symphony, which was awesome. It was so great to play all that music and do all that stuff. But I just felt there was things burbling inside that weren't having a voice um, and weren't coming out. So um, I decided to make a little change. Uh, my wife and I had, you know, we were young and early, you know, first married. And so Augusta was an interesting place to live, but we weren't really set on settling in the South. So we said, well, let's, you know, we're young and mobile. Let's make a change. So I ended up, um, going back from my doctorate and I went to University of California, San Diego. Um, and which is a very, and that really changed my whole career and my whole perspective. And how did you pick that school? Like how, what? Right. Well, um, a couple reasons. Uh, the main reason was that, uh, when I was at Indiana university, I, I said, I did a lot of new music there and the conductor of new music ensemble in Indiana university was a guy named Harvey Solberger who was a flutist and composer and conductor, just fantastic musician and a huge, huge influence on me. And uh, so unbeknownst to me, he had left Indiana and gone out to UCSD. And there, UC, the UCSD music department is actually the whole university is a fascinating place. It, it, it's very new. It only started in the like mid sixties. And it came out of like, um, like, scientists and engineers who had been brought to San Diego to do a lot of research during World War II, kind of a, you know, military industrial complex, but they were very much on the cutting edge of, of research in certain fields. And so when it came time to try to start a, a university, a California system university in San Diego, uh, the, the guys who started the university said, well, we need to bring out people who are innovative in every field, in music, in the arts, and theater, and English, and poli science history. So it was just kind of had this always that university has a, a history of, of being on the forefront. So in terms of music, it's pretty much a new music school. That's what they do. And it's, it had really good grad programs is where most of the emphasis is. So Harvey was out there and they were recruiting some performers and I didn't know he was there, but he called me up and said, Hey, you know, I'm, I saw, I had heard about the school and it looked kind of interesting. The program was a little different. Uh, and uh, he said, Hey, you know, you should come check this place out because I think you might really like it. So, I'm always looking for kind of like a, a different path. You know, I was like Indiana University, nice big Midwest school, Boston, you know, very traditional East Coast conservatory. Then I was looking for something different. The other school I was looking at was Michigan, which was a great, awesome doctoral program. But I went and checked it out and it felt like, well, going to Michigan is like going back to IU. I already, I've already been to IU, so I need something different. So 
I was a, though a kind of funky progressive West Coast school attracted me. Yeah, it was a really uh, a really interesting place. A lot of really really great musicians. It was a not a big department, but the people who are there are very very high quality composers and performers who want to play new music. And it's like really kind of it's very very high, kind of high modernist, pretty hardcore new music. In, in, Composers who want to write that stuff and players who want to play that. So, gotcha. um, yeah. Wow. That's so, a, it's a, yeah, it is really cool to see the, um, I mean, we'll kind of talk about your music in a little bit, but it, with your background, it's really fascinating how that all of the experiences that you've had just in schooling and um, the different styles of music really come into play. So. That. Yeah, that yeah, San Diego was really the place where it kind of blew everything wide open for me. And not only in turn, it was kind of funny because, like I said, it's a very it's uh, there's a it's mostly new music, and the people who go there are kind of focused on that. But I was kind of the opposite. I was looking coming out of the the classical realm that I'd been in, which was great. I was looking to expand, kind of. So I was looking for something a little different. And so there was a lot of new music, a lot of improvisation. Sure. Um, uh, and then also I started to, my world music kind of, not just like listening to it, but starting to play that started there as well. Started there. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Um, so kind of going into, I guess, um, a really substantial part of your playing career being in the Zeitgeist Ensemble, um, and that being entirely new music and commissioning, I know you've commissioned hundreds of works and constantly premiering works. Um, can you kind of give us a little background of how you got started with them um, and kind of the focus of that group and the music that you guys like to play? Sure, yeah. Uh, well, the Zeitgeist has been around for a very long time, much longer than I've been in the group. You know, the group formed in 1977. Um, it was some, you know, some, some, you know, some guys who were playing, you know, I think they were students at the U of M and in McAllister and they were into new music and um, some local players, somebody, somebody you may know, Jay Johnson, who's a percussionist in town, and there's uh, Joe Holmquist and some others. Robert Samarato, who was a longtime woodwind player in town, joined a little bit later. So they were the, they were the core of it starting in 77. I didn't join the group until like around 99. Um, but yeah, it's always been a group. And it's kind of a weird little group because uh, it started off as kind of a collective of people who wanted to play new music. And then and after, in the first few years, like people kind of fell away. And so what was left was this core of a woodwind player, two percussion and piano. So it's not your standard new music, but kind of your typical new music ensemble, like the standards like Puro plus percussion, you know, flute, clarinet, violin, cello, piano, percussion, often a singer as well. So this is kind of a different, kind of a different group <clears throat> instrumentation, which is, uh, uh, has its, uh, advantages and disadvantages <clears throat> for the composers and for the players just given that odd mix of things right. so you know i joined in 99 um uh one of the other percussionists in the group patty cud and i had been classmates uh in in san diego at ucsd and then patty had she's from this area so she had come back here and then she heard that they were looking for a woodwind player so they said hey you should call my my friend pat um down in san diego and so i, I was i was a attracted to the job because um, not just for Zeitgeist, but, uh, you know, I wanted to, to, to be able to do this mix of things. This was the thing I kind of discovered in San Diego was that, you know, I was doing a lot of new music and some free improvisation. Um, and I had discovered that I really, really liked, we all teach private and I love private teaching, but I also really love classroom teaching. I started doing that in Augusta and then did a lot in San Diego and I love classroom teaching. Um, and then I'd also, you know, the, the world music thing came into being when I started to uh, study Brazilian percussion in San Diego. And I played a lot of Brazilian percussion. I was as active as that uh, on that side as I was with the clarinet in San Diego. And, and I, I found that like, this is where uh, I thought I was finally like realizing my full potential of the musician I wanted to be just like, you know, all over the place. Some people probably think like, what is with this dude? He's like, he's, he's all over the place. Like, focus, man, one lane. But it's like, 
<laughs> no, it's like when I when I started to do all that different stuff, it's like, yeah, this is this is what I want to do. I want to be running from here to there, from this style of music to that style of music, to a class, to a private lesson, just bing, bing, bing. And so I wanted to be in a place where I could do that and went because my brother's been a musician here in the Twin Cities for a long time. I knew that the Twin Cities had a really great art scene and there was so many opportunities for playing and playing different styles and for teaching. I thought, okay, well, that that might be a place where I can kind of create the kind of, you know, little, little kind of career I'm looking for. So, so when I started... You Sorry, yeah. when you say um, classroom teaching, like, are you th are you talking like traditional music theory, music history kind of thing, or what kind of? Yeah, I, yeah, I've taught. Um, it, I, I teach out at UW River Falls. I've been there for a long time, and uh, so I t I have taught. Uh, what what I mostly teach is world music class, and also uh, um, in the last five years, I've been teaching a freshman seminar. So it's a, a class geared specifically to freshman students who are just entering into college. And so part of it is just helping them learn some skills that will help them be successful in college, like thinking about critical thinking and teamwork and information literacy, how to do things. And I've also taught, you know, some kind of like music appreciation stuff. And I, you know, like I do, we, we all, we just love to talk about music, right? And share our passion. So that's what I, I just like to do. And I like, you know, I like doing with music, with music, music majors, but also with non-majors, just getting them to think about the role of music in their life, the role of music all around us, how important it is. And so it's, I just, I really, it's fun to do and it's fun yeah. to see people eyes kind of light up and wow, I didn't think yes. of it that way. So yeah. that's the, you know, that's what I, you know, the lately the world music in the freshman seminar. Well, I, I love that you're into like such a diverse spectrum of music. Cause I think that helps to pull people, especially, you know, um, maybe the non-majors that you're talking about, um, kind of their backgrounds or, you know, just yeah. wherever they're coming from to like, you know, keep broadening the middle ground between mm -hmm. everybody. Um, so yeah. I think that's important. And I also think for like a chamber group, like Zeitgeist, having that, um, having those interests, um, helps to also like bring new ideas to the group and always kind of keep things like fresh and different. Yeah. I think it's probably mm -hmm. important as far as like progressing, you know, as a group. Yeah, one of the things it's one of the things I've I've liked about playing the Zeitgeist and playing new music, uh, but certainly through Zeitgeist is that, you know, as you said, we we commission a lot of people and people write a lot of new stuff for us. And usually it's composers that we know that we've worked with or that we you know we have kind of a workshop setting with them where they come in and get to know us as people and as players there's a lot of playing but also a lot of just eating and talking and you know getting to know so the music that they write for us tends to be very personal it tends to be like oh pat likes to do this or pat can do these things so i'll write that or you know and patty and heather the other, the other people in the group patty cut and heather Berenger, who's the other percussionist and our managing director she really runs the group and does all the heavy lifting of grant writing and stuff she's the one who's keeping that group afloat um and then nikki melville is our pianist she teaches down at carlton she's really awesome they're all awesome musicians and so yeah they we get really personal stuff for us and uh so that's nice and i like that then in any given concert with zeitgeist uh, you know some stuff might draw on like my classical training, so I have to do that. But you know, you know, improvisation often is something that we do, and is they call on us to improvise, or maybe the world music stuff, or extended techniques, whatever. You know, that's 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 the other thing that was that I was I was glad that it was the clarinet that came into my life because it's so flexible, right? Right. And I don't know. It's probably mostly clarinet players watching this, but like you know, <laughs> we're all in agreement it's the best, right? Like we know it's the the best instrument. No, they're all all instruments are great, but it's certainly one of its great characteristics is the fact that it is so flexible and can do so many different things. That's you know because I just I really like sound and a lot of times what I'm just doing is making funny sounds on it that I think are fun. I don't know if other people like I like it. So <laughs> and Aaron, I can do that. So yeah, that's very true. Yeah, I just have um, one more uh, tiny follow up, which is. People who are kind of starting to get into new music um, at you know wherever they are in their playing career, do you have any um, kind of advice, I guess, to those exploring new music or how they should go about it, or any resources or anything like that? You know, I would say um, I would definitely say meet composers. You know, if you're at a school or even if you're just still in high school, like find people who are writing music and get them to write music for you. 
hang out with composers, you know, and let them know that you want to play their music, you know, and then uh, that's, that, you know, that's really important. And listen, 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 find as much new music as you can. I mean, it's, there's so many things now and it's all available to us on the internet, you know, through the YouTube and stuff like that. And I, just, you know, probably when, when I was young and I was getting into contemporary music, I was, I was lucky that I had a few resources to find it, but you know, there was no YouTube. So when you found an album that was Stockhausen, wow, I, I've been hearing about this guy's name. I got to hear this or whatever, you know, you just, that was then this is now it's all at your fingertips. So just, uh, but for so many things, whether it's the contemporary music or classical music or any of the world music styles I've studied, I just like the importance of listening to that stuff is really, really important just to put it in your ears to get a sense of it, what it's about, how it's played, all the subtle nuances, you know, all the stuff that you can't write down in the score. Um, so listening, listening, listening is very important. As a kid, I was like, I, you know, I practiced when I was in high school, but I never practiced as much as I should have, you know, but I was, but I was always, if I wasn't practicing, I was either listening to music or I was reading about it or I was looking at scores. So, you know, now always just soak up as much as you can. So. Mm -hmm. That's great. Yeah. We hear that a lot, especially, um, you know, kind of with jazz musicians, right? There are, they're like, you know, you can, sit in the practice room and study your scales and your <laughs> your modes and all that kind of stuff but you have to immerse yourself and to know how to then implement that right and so yeah this is all about i mean you can say that same for the classical side of things you know um, yeah i think all of it yeah practice. definitely <laughs> yeah, you're bringing, we're bringing our life into our instrument we're bringing our whole life experiences into how we make music so the more you have out there to bring into the practice room, the more you can, you know, utilize. Right. 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 Exactly. Yeah. Great. So obviously, you know, we're in this unprecedented, unusual time of COVID. Um, so what kind of things have you done that's either music related or non-music related that's kind of kept you motivated through everything that's been going on? Yeah, it's, um, it's, it's been hard. I think it's been hard for all of us and uh, it's, Partially, it's hard for me because I'm not always the most self-motivated. Like it's, I work great on deadlines and I'm, you know, I'm great when I have like my music, my music stands. Like I got all these pieces I got to learn. I got this gig here. I got Zegas, whatever. I got, you know, a whole ton of stuff. Great. I know what I got to do. Now you take all that away. It's like, well, what am I going to, what am I going to practice? I, I mean, there's packs, stacks and stacks of stuff I'll get to, you know, but. Somehow, I don't know, sometimes if I have, if I have 50 things to do in a week, I'll like, oh, work hard to cram them in. And if I only got five things, I'll somehow manage to make those five things last a whole week. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but what, you know, one thing that helped me, I was lucky is uh, one of my longtime, very, very close friends and collaborators in music and new music is a computer musician named Scott Miller, who teaches up at St. Cloud State, and he specializes in computer music. And so almost as soon as the COVID thing hit and everyone had to lock down, Scott was on, you know, calling me up and said, okay, we got to start, we got to start playing, you know, online together. Because a lot of the music we've created together is kind of improv based. I'm playing and I'm improvising and he's taking my sound and then he's transforming it with the computer. And then I'm improvising to that. And that's kind of how we work. Yeah. We call our, our kind of duo project willful devices because whether it's a clarinet or it's a computer you know sometimes you're trying to control the clarinet but you can't always control it it's got a mind of its own you know sometimes the computer is the same way so you know we, we're trying to control but anyway so scott from almost from the beginning let's like let's figure out how we can like keep making music just like this over zoom so we had like tons of i think he was he was doing this with me and with some other people all over the planet. I was kind of like his guinea pig to figure out how it could work, you know? And so we would just like, we would improvise and, and work through Zoom and through Skype and Face. Sometimes we would have like Zoom and Skype and FaceTime and something else all open at the same time. Like I'm gonna send, I'll send a signal through this and then you send it back over here. And we just tried a ton of different stuff. We've actually done some online performances live streaming from this very room. I've done some concerts from in here that, uh, and I was surprised at how much when I did it, you know, I felt like, oh, this feels like a real performance. I got some real performance juices flowing. I, I didn't expect that, you know, when there's no audience there to give you feedback, but 
anyway, so that's been that's been a really nice thing to do. That's really cool. Is that something that you feel? I know you said you'll continue to do it, but do you feel that that is something that's going to be kind of a part of programming, kind of moving forward, just across the board with musicians? This new wave, I, of, you know, us being innovative that way. I think so. Yeah, I think you know it, we all we we adapt. You know, humans are just ever so flexible and adaptable, and so we just find a way. Okay, well, live concerts aren't happening, or they're happening on a very small scale. You know. We've managed to do a few. Zeitgeist did one down in Red Wing where it was like for a socially distanced audience of about 20, but it was still, you know, it was, we managed to do it. It was nice. And, right. but yeah, I think people are, are making this kind of thing work now. So I think that's going to be uh, just another option. I'm sure as soon as I have no doubt that as soon as live concerts can come back, everyone will want to do that because we're all jonesing for it so bad. Yes. But I think now that we have this as well, and people are working out the kinks of this, this will just be another way, and a way to connect with more people, you know, around the whole planet. So. Right, right, that's true. Yeah, especially the the vast, you know, amount of people that we can not only tap into, but that you can collaborate with. I mean. Yeah, right, right? yeah. That's, that's huge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The things we were doing, that Scott and I did, we were for some kind of like, kind of internet-based festivals, so, you know, people were kind of dialing in from all over the world, and I've watched some programs, too, where you got musicians kind of improvising together from all over, like people in Japan, people in Austria, somebody in New York, somebody right here, just, you can come together now, so. So where can people find those recordings you did with, Scott? Um, I think there, I think one of them is on YouTube, or if you, maybe if you go to the Zeitgeist website, okay. or Studio Z website, we did a, a big show in, in, in uh in June okay. at the end of uh, in later June okay. that was um that was, was it was very meaningful for us because you know I mean the whole COVID situation is very difficult and then of course the whole George Floyd thing that happened really just like turned tipped everything just you know it's just really difficult and so what maybe a lot of people m maybe didn't know is that for for a certain music community here in town uh, especially like the jazz community or improvised music and new music committee, um, we lost a really important composer that same week, just a few days after George Floyd. His name was Kerry Thomas. I don't know if you guys know Kerry Thomas, really the sweet man and wonderful composer and improviser. And he passed away just a few days later. So it was a, that was a really tough week. So when we uh, when Scott and I did our our first show in in later June, we kind of did it. Part of it was a tribute to Kerry. We played some of his scores. Um, we started, started and ended the concert with, with Carrie. So I think you can find that on YouTube. You know, Scott and I are willful devices or Carrie Thomas tribute. It's C-A-R-E-I Thomas tribute. So yeah, that was, that was really fun. And it meant, you know, it meant just a nice, it felt good to honor Carrie for that. Yeah, that's, that's really great. My question was just um, if you kind of have one or two of, you know, major accomplishments that you're really proud of, whether that's an actual, you know, a specific experience or event performance or something bigger overall, like being part of the Zeitgeist Ensemble or, you know, teaching or anything like that. Yeah, I, I'm sure it's probably the same for you guys and for everybody hopefully is listening. Um, not only do I find music to be a really um, rewarding profession to be in, but I'm very proud just to be a musician because you know, look, we all know there's a lot of great things in this world and there's a lot of not great things. And we as human beings have the capacity for really amazing creation, but also pretty horrible destruction um, throughout history. Um, but, you know, music is one of these things that's been there. I mean, the evidence goes back 30,000 years that, you know, people have been doing this. It's clearly something that is very, very vitally important to human beings. And so I think it's, you know, it's, it's, I'm proud that what not, I'm not talking me personally, I'm just what musicians can give to other people to, uh, you know, to make their lives better for maybe just a few minutes or for an hour or for a concert or through teaching or any of the things that we do, any of these musical activities, you know, it's just, I think it's a really great thing that we as humans do this. And I'm very proud to be a part of it. Uh, no matter where on the continuum you are, whether you're um, in the just the most incredible 
musician in the, you know, on the, the top of your profession or you're, you know, just a, a, somebody who's like a local musician or playing in your local band or whatever, there's this whole continuum, but we're all a part of it. We're all part of this musical thing and it, not just in our culture, but in all of the cultures all over the world, it's, it's such an important thing to us. It means different things to every culture, right? Uh, it, that's the thing that doesn't translate is the meaning, but the action is there. We do these things with objects. We manipulate them to make sound and that sound has meaning to us. We do something with our voice that's beyond talking and that has, that's special and it has meaning to us. So I'm just proud to be a part of that. I think that's what I'm, you know, the most proud of just being involved with music period. Yeah. I love that answer. Yeah. It's pretty extraordinary. Like once you really sit down and just kind of think about what we do, you know, it's, um, I mean, for clarinetists, it's like a stick of wood, you know, right. Right. He's on it and just how far that's come and what that can do. And that's just our instrument. And then you think about the other yeah. one and then the instruments from other countries. And it's just, it's incredible. Oh, yeah. I was, I'm just, I love, Music, like I said, I love sound, and so I love all musical instruments. You know, this is why I just love YouTube. I can just sit for hours just watching, you know, videos of music from all over. But the thing is, I think about is like, in terms of musical instruments, there is not that many different ways to make them. I mean, there you've got wind instruments. They're excited column of air, either it's with a reed, one or two reeds, or end blown with a flute, or you buzz. You know. That's, there's those there's those three ways, right. but there's like a th million varieties of instruments based on that. Same with like string instruments. There's a few ways to excite that string and get it vibrating, yeah. uh, but there's like a million variations on that. So there's only a few like basic types of instruments, but there's just infinite varieties, and I just find that fascinating. Yeah. Right? And how, yeah, and how it changes and adapts and the use of right. it. And I mean, just in American, you know, music history, just that in general is, mm -hmm. is massive. <laughs> well, I, you know, humans, like we said, we're, we're adaptable and flexible and creative, and we're going to take with whatever we have, like whatever's at hand, we will make music out of that. And if something is denied to us and taken away, well, then we'll find another way, you know, we'll take something else to make it. And nowadays, what, you know, I mean, not nowadays, for the last 30 years, musicians have just been making music out of old music, whether you're scratching on a record or sampling, or whatever, it's just, it's another thing. It's another thing for us to manipulate and use to make music with. So we're, you know, humans are very adaptable and creative that way. Yeah, that's great. Um, that's really good. All right, so that was our last question. Thank you so much for being part of our virtual series. Um, we were excited to kind of learn about you and your music, and we look forward to seeing, you know, what, what other projects come about, um, you know, after this time that we're in, but um, it's definitely something <laughs> to look forward to. So thank you again for being with us. Well, thank you. I'm, I was honored that you asked, so thanks so much. I really enjoyed it. Sounds good.